Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We are on ayah number 186 of Surah Al-Baqarah. قال الله تعالى وإذا سألك عبادي عني فإني قريب أجيب دعوة الداعي إذا دعان فليستجيبوا لي وليؤمنوا بي لعلهم يرشدون So the word عبادي is plural of عبد my servants So the servants, the Muslimin are asking the Prophet about Allah جل وعلا answering the dua then the answer is, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Indeed, I am near. Now this does not mean Allah is physically near you, as in sitting right next to you. But near you, as in He sees everything you do, hears everything you do, knows about all that you do and intend. So a person who is physically near you can see you, can hear you, and knows about you. And Allah Jalla wa'ala in that sense is just like that, nay, even more so. Ujibu, I answer, the call of the caller when he calls me. So, da'a yad'u, to call. Then he says, fal yastajibu li. The fa is sababiya. So, because I answer du'a, let them. The lam is the lam al-amr, as in let them, or they must. Yastajibu li. Normally this means answer me. But what it's referring to is let them obey me. وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا be let them have iman in me لَعَلَّهُمْ this is ta'leel يَرْشُدُونَ رُشْد is guidance so that they may be guided يَحْتَدُونَ the reason for this ayah is given that the companions asked is Allah near so that we ask him in private or is he far away so that we should call out to him and so in answer to that this ayah was revealed it has also been said that a Yahudi asked if you say that between this earth and the heavens is 500 years journey and the width of each heaven is 500 years journey then how can Allah Jalla wa'ala hear us when we call out to him? And so this ayah was revealed in response to that and Allah knows best about the sabab of this ayah it is entirely possible that both are correct. You will also notice that the ayah before this ayah was talking about the siyam and some of the rulings on siyam such as the sighting of the moon and the obligation of the fasting of Ramadan and the abrogation of the choice. The ayah after this also speaks about Ramadan, it also speaks about another abrogation. So this ayah of dua is sandwiched in between those two ayat. It seems a little off place. We may answer by saying that this ayah is apparently out of place because of the importance of making dua to Allah Jalla wa'ala. So that the idea of dua is so vital that it will even be put into a place which ordinarily you would not expect it to be in, such as sandwiched between two ayat of Siyam. We may also argue by saying that there is a direct link between the ayat of Siyam and this ayat of dua in that the dua made in the siyam is more potent than any other dua and that when a fasting person makes dua then it is more likely to be accepted and this is further given some credibility with the authentic hadith in which the prophet ﷺ said thalathatun la turaddu da'watuhum three people whose dua will not be rejected Al-Imam Al-Adil, the just Imam, Wasa'imu Hatta Yufdir, and the fasting person until he breaks his fast. Wada'watul Madlum, and the dua of the one who has been oppressed. Yarfa'uha Allahu fawq al-ghamam, wa tuftahu laha abuwabu sama. Allah raises it above the clouds, and the gates of the heavens are open for it. Wa yaqul bi'izzati la ansurannaka walaw ba'dahin. And Allah says, by my honor, I will help you even if it is after a time. So with these three people the dua is made more potent as a type of compensation. For the just Imam, he has the difficult duty to lead a people and heavy responsibilities on his shoulders so as a compensation his dua is more potent. The fasting person has left off his food and his drink and his conjugal relations with the spouse. So as a compensation, his or her du'a is more potent. 
As for the oppressed person, he has been oppressed, so as a compensation, his or her dua is more potent. Okay, so reflecting on this ayah, we of course find the importance of dua, and we also find this characteristic of Allah Jalla wa'ala of being qareeb. Now, here's the question. Is Allah being qareeb, is it the same as ma'iyya, Allah being with somebody? When Allah is with somebody, we can say the ma'iyya is am wa khas. Am, general, he is with everybody, Muslim and kafir, in that he knows all that they're doing, sees all that they're doing, hears all that they're doing, and so on. He is with them in that sense. He's never physically with anybody. He's not sitting next to you. And then we have the ma'iyya khasa, the special type of ma'iyya. And this is when Allah Jalla wa'ala helps his servants. It is with love. Allah does not love the kuffar. He only loves the believers. And so he's with the believers as he is with the kuffar, but with the extra bonus of love and help. So the ma'iyya is of two types. Now can we say the same thing about the qurba? Allah is qareeb. Can we say he is qareeb? near to everybody, this is Am, and he's Qareeb, near to the believers, which is accompanied by love and help, just as with the Ma'iyya. Well, there's a difference of opinion in this matter, but it may be argued that the weightier opinion is that the Qareeb is only for those who call out to him with sincerity. So Allah is not near the Kuffar, but he is only near the believers, whereas he is with the kuffar and the believers, the am and khas, like we mentioned. Now this may seem surprising. However, if we are to follow the text extremely strictly, we find that qareeb is only mentioned in the context of those who call upon him. Now some people might say, but what about in Surah Qaf? Where Allah says, نَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ We are closer to him than his jugular vein. The intended meaning here is the angels. Allah does say we, but he is referring to the angels. Because if you read on, he says, إِذْ يَتَلَقَّ الْمُتَلَقِّيَانِ عَنِ الْيَمِينِ وَعَنِ الشِّمَالِ قَحِيدِ So he's talking about the two angels, one on the right, one on the left. So it appears from the context of the ayah that Allah is qareeb only to those who call upon him, whether that person is a Muslim or a Kafir, because as we know for sure, Allah Jalla wa'ala does answer the call of Kufar. As long as this Da'i, this caller, is calling upon Allah with Ikhlas. Others may say that Allah is only Qareeb with love to the believers, because when he's Qareeb, it has to entail with love, and Allah does not love the Kufar. So this is another opinion. However, looking at the context of the ayah, it does speak about dua and those who call upon Allah sincerely. But the point is that can be done by the Muslim and the kafir. We find from this ayah, reflecting on it, that Allah Jalla wa'ala answers the calls. And this is from his rububiyyah. A true Rabb will answer people's calls. Now this does not mean that he may give you what you ask for immediately. Sometimes Allah Jalla wa'ala can deliberately delay the dua to increase the servant in his dua and in his reward and in his iman as the servant makes dua. Let's take ayah 187. We return to the matter of as siyam Allah Jalla wa'ala says, أُحِلَّ لَكُمْ لَيْلَةَ الصِّيَامِ الرَّفَثُ إِلَى نِسَائِكُمْ هُنَّ لِبَاسٌ لَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لِبَاسٌ لَهُنْ عَلِمَ اللَّهُ أَنَّكُمْ كُنْتُمْ تَخْتَانُونَ أَنفُسَكُمْ فَتَابَ عَلَيْكُمْ وَعَفَا عَنْكُمْ فَالْآنَ بَاشِرُوهُنَّ وَبْتَغُوا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَكُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَضُ مِنَ الْخَيْطِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ ثُمَّ أَتِمُّوا الصِّيَامَ إِلَى اللَّيْلِ وَلَا تُبَاشِرُوهُنَّ وَأَنْتُمْ عَاكِفُونَ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ تِلْكَ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ فَلَا تَقْرَبُوهَا كَذَلِكَ يُبَيِّنُ اللَّهُ آيَاتِهِ لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ He begins by saying أُحِلَّ لَكُمْ From Halal we spoke about this before. Laylat al-Siyam, the night of Siyam. الرَّفَثُ إِلَى نِسَائِكُمْ 
So Nisa meaning women, Nisa ikum your wives. So what is a rafath? This means conjugal relations with your wives. Now originally a rafath does not mean conjugal relations with your spouse, that is sexual relations with your spouse. A rafath normally means vulgar or ugly language. So it's when people use abusive or vulgar words. And much does Allah Jalla wa'ala use this type of kinaya to indicate sexual intercourse. The normal word for sexual intercourse in the Arabic will be jima'ah. But you do not see this word being used every time he refers to sexual intercourse. Rather he uses kinayat which is a metonym. One word to indicate another word due to a link between them. It's a form of majaz metaphor. There are other examples. فَلَمَّا تَغَشَّاهَا When he covered her. فَأْتُوا حَرْثَكُمْ Go to your tilled land. فَالْآنَ بَاشِرُوهُنَّ Now touch them directly, as in skin to skin. أَوْ لَا مَسْتُمُ nisa When you have touched women. He says, هُنَّ لِبَاسُ لَكُمْ so libas is clothing, that is well known, and he's saying that these spouses are clothing for each other. Of course, physical clothing cannot be intended here. There are at least two ways in which this can be understood. The first way, your libas, your clothing is always with you, and so the spouses are always with each other, just like clothing giving each other comfort. The second way to understand this is just like your clothing protects you from the elements as you go outside, so your spouse protects you from fornication and looking at haram things and so on. So you may say your spouse grants you sexual protection. Authentically, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا تَزَوَّجَ الْعَبْدِ فَقَدْ إِسْتَكْمَلَ نِصْفَ الدِّينِ فَلْيَتَّقِ اللَّهَ فِي النِصْفِ الْبَاقِي When a servant marries, he completes half of the deen, so let him fear Allah for the other half. So the half of the deen which he completes when he marries is talking about the sexual protection. So it protects him from fornication. It protects him from looking desirously at other non-mahram women. And this is referred to as half of your deen. As for the other half, you fear Allah by doing what he commands and refraining from the other prohibited actions. He uses the word takhtanuna from khiana to betray. You are betraying yourselves. This basically refers to committing sins and oppressing your own self because whoever commits sins oppresses his own self because the harms of his sins are going to come back to haunt him. So anyone who commits sins is oppressing himself and he's also betraying his own self. Fataba alaykum, he accepted your repentance, wa afa ankum and he overlooked your errors. Okay, so we know what the words mean, but as always, the most difficult element of the tafsir is to know what this message refers to. And here we need the tafsir. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma has a statement about this. He says that this betrayal of the self is referring to the following. In the beginning, when the Muslimun were fasting, they would break their fast at Maghrib, and then they can eat and drink and have conjugal relations with their wife after Maghrib. However, after Isha, they were not allowed to eat and drink and have conjugal relations. So essentially the fasting began from Isha. And as is understandable, this would be difficult. And there were many people, including Umar ibn al-Khattab, who would have conjugal relations with their wives after Isha. And so they complained to the Prophet about this. And this ayah was sent down to abrogate this ruling about the Isha. So it's now telling us that you can eat and drink and you can have conjugal relations with your wife as well up till the Fajr time. So it is permissible to do all of that after Isha. He says, فَالْآنَ بَاشِرُهُنَّ From Bashara, which means the skin. So بَاشَرَ يُبَاشِرُ Which means to touch skin with skin. Again, this is kinaya for sexual intercourse. وَبْتَهُ مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَبْتَهُ بَغَى يَبْغِي That's the root letters to seek. 
what Allah has kataba as in ordained for you. So what does this refer to? It refers to children because the children result from the conjugal relations. So the Muslim is to seek children. And then he says, eat and drink hatta yatabayyana until tabayyana, which means to become clear. From bayyan, of course, clear. Al khayt al abyad. Khayt is a string, or you could say a thread. Abyad means white. So the white thread. Again, we know the words, but what is it referring to? It's referring to the whiteness of the dawn, the true fajr. That is when you see the light of the sun spreading horizontally across the horizon. And the al khayt al aswad, the black thread, that's of the night. So we find again he is using a kinaya, one word to denote another word or concept. ثُمَّ أَتِمُّ الصِّيَامَ إِلَى اللَّيْلِ Then complete the siyam, we talked about siyam, up till the layl, night. Now what does night mean? When is it night? We find from the narrations that night is maghrib. And then he talks about i'tikaf, which is done in Ramadan. Specifically, the last 10 days of Ramadan, as is well known. He says, وَلَا تُبَاشِرُهُنَّ Again, kinaya. Do not make skin-to-skin -skin contact. That refers to conjugal relations. Hunna is the plural of the females, them. وَأَنْتُمْ عَاكِفُونَ So, akafa means to stay at one place. The word masajid, plural of masjid, the place of sajda, referring to the place of prayer. Tilka hududullah, plural of had is hudud, which means limits. So when Allah gives you commands, these are the limits of Allah. Do not overstep the limits, meaning do not be guilty of any infraction of the sharia. Fala taqrabuha, do not go near them, meaning do not even go near to committing the haram, because you never know, you may actually fall into the haram. So this is more emphatic than saying do not breach the limits. He's saying do not even go near them. Kadhalika, like this, meaning to say, just like what has proceeded, where Allah makes plain to you the rules of the psalm and so on, like this, he makes plain to you, Yubayyinullahu, Allah makes plain to you, ayatihi, his signs, be it shara'i signs or kawniya, as we said there are two types of signs, linnas, to the people, لَعَلَّهُمْ We said this before is ta'lil يَتَّقُونَ They may attain taqwa And we spoke about taqwa before So reflecting on this ayah We may take that an abrogation is taking place in this ayah And we actually need some narrations as well as this ayah to fully understand the abrogation But like we mentioned before The eating and drinking up till Salat al-Asha And then afterwards you're not allowed to eat and drink nor have conjugal relations. And this was a difficult ruling. There is another suburb of the Nuzul of this ayah as well. An Ansari by the name of Qais ibn Surma was fasting and he was working during the day. He could not find any food to make iftar with. His wife went searching for some food. When she came back, she found him sleeping because he was tired. Now why was that a problem? It was a problem because the rule at that time was if you go to sleep after the iftar time then when you wake up your fasting has begun. You're not allowed to eat or drink or have conjugal relations thereafter. So again you can see this is an incredibly difficult rule. Now what happened with him with Qais was that of course now he could not eat or drink because his fasting essentially has begun. The next day he was working and halfway during the day he fell unconscious because he had not eaten or drunk anything for many a long hour and so this ayah is an incredible relief of course you would not feel this relief because the strict rules which were in place before do not apply to you but you have to understand it from their point of view this ayah was like a lifesaver we take that Allah is all aware of what we are doing as he says that Allah knows you were betraying your own selves. And any act of disobedience is self-betrayal as it is self-oppression. You are not harming Allah in aught.
But we take that Allah is most merciful as he accepts people's repentance if they are truly regretful of what they have done and he effaces their sins and overlooks them. We also find that in having conjugal relations with your wife, you should seek to have children and the more the merrier because the Prophet wants his ummah to be the largest it can be. So all this talk about limiting your children and family planning and so on, this is un-Islamic. Allah Jalla wa is telling you to seek children and the kuffar are telling you to limit your children. So you can see it's like night and day. Now in this idea of eating and drinking up till the Fajr, some ulama say that eating and drinking during the last part of the night, meaning before the Fajr, is better because eating and drinking up to the Fajr is there to make life easier. But if you eat and drink just before Fajr, this would make life easier than if you were to eat and drink at the first part of the night. And because this ayah is making life easier, it would be then recommended to eat and drink during the last part of the night, just before the break of dawn. We also take from the word tabayyana that you stop eating and drinking or having conjugal relations with your wife when the fajr becomes bayyan or clear to you. So which means that if you are in doubt as to whether fajr has begun or not, then you may keep eating and drinking until it becomes clear to you. So do not let any doubt put you off eating and drinking. But when you know Fajr has begun or it is predominant in your thought that Fajr has begun, then yes, you must stop eating and drinking and conjugal relations with your spouse. And on this point, it's worth noting that there are some people who give the Adhan of the Fajr before its proper time in Ramadan and they do this to be on the safe side so that people stop eating and drinking so that they do not overstep the mark. And this is a mistake. There is no need for this quote-unquote being on the safe side argument. Rather, you just follow what the Quran says until the Fajr becomes clear to you. Even if in reality you ended up eating beyond the Fajr time, you are not sinful because you have been obeying the ayah of the Quran. It's as simple as that. We can also take that al-wasal should not be done. So al-wasal is when you join two days of fasting in a row and you do not break the fast in between. This is because the Quran tells us that to complete the siyam up till the layl, up till the night, which we know from narrations is maghrib. The ayah talks about the white thread of fajr. Fajr normally in the language means to split open something for water to pass through. And here Fajr is dawn break because the night splits open for the light to pass through. We can also take the legislation of I'tikaf and that the I'tikaf needs to be done in the Masajid. And so this is a Masjid in which the five times Jama'ah is held. Because if it is held in a Masjid in which we do not have a regular five times Jama'ah, then this means people making I'tikaf in that Masjid will not be able to pray the five times Jama'ah regularly and the Jama'ah is wajib for the males. The alternative is they'll have to leave the Masjid to go to another Masjid in which the Jama'ah is being held but then this negates the spirit of the I'tikaf which is to stay in the Masjid. Okay well what about women? With women it's much more flexible. They can make I'tikaf in a Masjid in which the five times Jama'ah is not regularly held because they are not obliged to attend the Jama'ah so for them it's more flexible. In any case, the i'tikaf is in the masjid, which is a building built for the salah. We also take that conjugal relations with your spouse will nullify your i'tikaf. We also take that anything which is haram, you need to stay clear from it and do not even go near it. We also find that the Quran is a book of clarification, of bayan. It is not a book of confusion. And any confusion you may have is simply a lack of your knowledge which you can remedy by learning. We may also learn that an increase in knowledge increases you in taqwa. Notice how he says, لَعَلَّهُمْ يتقون. And finally, let us just end on a fiqhi matter which is related to the ayah which is that if somebody is eating or drinking 
during Ramadan before the Fajr and then he hears the Adhan of the Fajr should he drop what is in his hands from the food or drink and should he spit out what is in his mouth or should he continue finishing off what he is eating or drinking we have an authentic narration in Sunan Abi Dawood in his chapter of fasting where the Prophet said إِذَا سَمِعَ أَحَدُكُمْ النِّدَاءِ وَالْإِنَاءُ عَلَى يَدِهِ فَلَا يَبَعْهُ حَتَّى يَقْضِيَ حَاجَتَهُ مِنْ When one of you hears the adhan and he has a cup in his hand, then do not put the cup down until he finishes drinking from it. So it appears that there is some leeway that you can finish off what is in your hand from food or drink, as long as it's a small amount. So of course you do not want to take liberties and go way overboard but if you are eating and drinking a little beyond the adhan because you initially started eating and drinking before the adhan then you can finish it after the adhan within reason. Wallahu a'lam.